Okay, so um, thank you for um, this invitation to, to speak to this audience, uh, which is a quite diverse audience of some scientists, some students. Um, but I think one thing that you all probably have in common is that at some point in your life, you will have to write something, whether it's an essay or a book or a report or a scientific paper um, in, in school or in university or in, as professional scientists. So I've been a professional, I'm, I'm a physicist originally, but I've been a professional writer for 20 years. And um, writing is a funny thing. It's a complicated process. Um, it's creative. It's a struggle. It can involve a lot of suffering. And um, more recently, I've been teaching PhD students to how to write um, better and, and also how to hopefully take some of the pain out of the process of writing. So I want to say a few things about the, the creative process of writing today. Um, so this is a book I wrote. This is my first book, which I wrote 20 years ago. And I'm not going to talk about the book at all. It's just a book. And um, I have a, had occasion to look back at the book many years later. And you look into it, and I thought, well, you know, it's not so bad. That's a good thing. Um, but more than that, I look at it, and I think, I don't really understand how I wrote that book. It's really smarter than I am. It's more creative than I am. The text on the page is beyond my brain. It, it makes connections between events and history and physics ideas, all really densely connected. And I can't remember now how I possibly put that all together. It's beyond what my brain could certainly do in any small portion of time right now. And I don't think that's because I'm 20 years older. I think it's because there's something about the process of writing a text that does make it smarter than the person and, and more creative than the person who produces it. And so I want to talk about why I think that's the case and why I think it's actually closely linked up to the process of, of biological evolution. So if we think about evolution, let's forget writing for the moment and go back to something biological, the human brain. It's an amazing thing. It's super complex, super powerful, and it's, amazing, it's an amazing solution to an extremely hard problem, which is the problem of surviving and thriving in a very hostile, complicated, ever-changing environment. And it's an environment that involves other people and brains with social lives conspiring possibly against you. It has lots of risks. It's a very vibrant, rich environment. And the brain has evolved to handle language and face recognition and all kinds of tasks, meanwhile keeping your body running at the same time. It's an amazing design to a very um, solution to a very complicated problem. And we can ask, of course, who designed the brain? You know, if it's such an amazing solution, who found this solution? You know, did it have a designer? And of course, there are all the historical debates between religion and other ideas. Nowadays, at least scientifically, we come down and say, well, it was evolution. It's this idea of, of Darwin's that the brain evolved through a, a long um, descent with modification was the phrase that Darwin used in, in his, his writings. He never actually used the word evolution, I, I believe, by which the designs that work slightly better have more offspring in the future. Those designs get passed on into the future. The ones that are better adapted to their conditions get passed along, whereas those that are not so well adapted fall by the wayside because they can't produce as many offspring. Now there's, there's actually two elements to this, this mechanism of evolution, and the two are known as selection and exploration. So let's think of it in terms of this, this frog that I pictured here. So you have a pond full of frogs. They're colorful because they can blend into the surroundings. They have sticky feet, sticky tongues, fast tongues that can try to catch flies. And in one generation, the, f the frogs that will tend to have the most offspring are those that have the longest tongues, the quickest tongues, because they can get more food, they can have more offspring. And so those, those designs are selected out and pushed into the future preferentially, because they they're slightly more advantageous, they can get more food. But the next generation isn't just a perfect copy of the last generation of frogs. There's always mutations, and there's frogs have sex with one another. There's sexual recombination and re-collectivizing um, of the genes. And in the next generation, you have new designs. So those, those orange feet probably weren't there all the time in the lineage of frogs into, into the past history. 
Maybe they used to have green feet. The green feet mean, meant they stuck out on certain orange rocks where they had to stand. They could be caught by predators. At some point, some mutations led to a few frogs having little orange spots on their feet. Those frogs started doing better, having more offspring. Pretty soon, the orange feet spread through the population. So each level of, of, of this evolution, from one stage to the next, involves selection, selecting out the better things that work a little bit better, but also exploration, always testing out new designs, totally new possibilities that never existed in the population before. Okay, so if we go back to the human brain, we can say that you know, evolution is, is, is essentially a random process. These mutations are not directed. No one's deciding that th that would be a good one, this one's a bad one. Each mutation is a random decision. It just happens. And then this selection selects out the ones that worked well and the ones that didn't work so well just fall by the wayside. The brain is a kind of an amazing solution to an, an extremely hard problem that is designed by a totally random unintelligent process. Okay, so with that in mind, we can go back to this problem of how is it that my book is smarter than I am? And I think there's, it's part of the process of, of, of production that has made this happen. So writing is also a, a messy process. It's not easy. And I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone in finding that when I have a task of writing something, I can always find lots of excuses, you know, why the dishes probably need doing or why the dogs need walking. There's a million other things that suddenly become very important when it's time to write my first draft. But at some point, the deadline looms and I have to force myself to write the first draft. Um, and so everyone, every writer's a little bit different. I learned long ago that if I write on a computer, that's no good for me because I, I type in the first paragraph and then I'll start on the second paragraph but my eyes keep wandering up, and I look at the first paragraph, and I see that sentence isn't perfect. I could fix that sentence, and I do that. Second paragraph again, oh, actually the first sentence, I could fix that one a little bit. Four hours later, I have one beautiful paragraph, but that's not what I need. I need, I need a draft of my article. All right, so I have long ago, I gave up writing a first draft on a computer, and I use a piece of paper like this and a pen. It's always a piece of paper just like this, folded over in half, I take it outside and I sit there by myself and I start thinking, what am I trying to say? What's the argument I'm trying to put out here? And I'll write maybe, if I'm writing a thousand word essay, you know, maybe 10 paragraphs that I'll write out, um, some little notes to myself to insert this or that. I'm out there for a couple hours, I take it back in, I type it in and I print it out. And I've got my first draft then, which I can start working on. Now you know, maybe you don't know, if anyone who's had the experience of writing will probably know that the first draft often isn't very nice. And in fact, it's usually pretty terrible. It's embarrassingly terrible often, so much that I would never show my first draft to anyone. Um, there's, a, there's a writer for the New York Times, um, well she's a novelist, but she occasionally writes for the New York Times, and she has a great phrase, Pamela Druckerman's her name, says, a part of the creative process is tolerating the gap between the glorious image you had in your mind and the sad thing you've just made. Because you were so ambitious, you had visions of this glorious thing that was gonna change the world, and then you've produced this, and it's, it's depressing. But as she says, you have to tolerate the gap, because the miracle comes afterward. The first draft is just the, is that bit of pain you have to go through, but the miracle comes afterward, which is the editing process, which has a kind of evolutionary magic in it that produces something that is way better than this first draft. So, what comes next? <coughs> of course, revision, editing, first draft becomes a second draft, you change lots of things, add in some stuff, take some stuff out, have new ideas, then you type that in, this is at least the way I do it, other people work differently, print it out again, third draft, fourth draft, fifth draft, hopefully by this time you think it's starting to you know, converge towards something. Um, and um, so I, I found this when I was looking around planning this talk, it's from a high school lecture on writing and it says the essence of writing is rewriting and that's very good I think it shows people scribbling things out in red ink getting a new version scribbling out again and gets across the idea that things should hopefully get better as the number of drafts goes up okay I want to say a little bit more about what happens on each on each level though so <coughs> when I go from draft two to draft three for example what happens this process of evolution 
has these two things in it. It has selection, that's taking up and pushing on the things that work pretty well, getting rid of the stuff that doesn't, and exploration, trying out new things, new combinations, inserting totally new pieces, um, making connections that weren't there before. So the new draft or new generation has totally new content and design in it. So this is exactly what happens in going from, say, draft two to draft three or three to four. One thing is, is I do, and I think most writers do, is you look through and there's some obvious things that are just wrong or stupid. Cross that out. That's just a mistake. I didn't mean to say that. My brain was being really lazy at that moment. I remember that. Get rid of that. Um, or, okay, that, that's the easy part, the, the selecting out the parts that don't work. The slightly harder part, but also the, the much more profitable part, is the exploration. And this is where, you know, your brain, even if you just sit in a room with the lights out, your brain is percolating along. There's thoughts that are coming up. You don't even have to make an effort. This will happen. It's hard, actually, to try to stop it. That's what people try to do in meditation. So if you just stick your face in your draft and start thinking about it, your brain will automatically start thinking, oh, well, that thought there where I say human life is complex, that's kind of a vague thing to say. I really need to spell that out. What do I mean? Is it complex because of the social world or because I have habits that I have to overcome? Or what is it? There could be lots of things. OK, so I had an incomplete thought. I need to spell out what that means. So that's one bit of exploration. Um, you have thoughts that are slightly wrong, but they're not totally wrong. There's a bit of good and a bit of bad in there. So you, you find the bit of good, and that alerts you. It says, look, look here, there's a bit of good here. Fix it. And you can fix that and make it something that's slightly better. So your, your text stimulates you, and, and your brain can latch onto things and have, have better ideas. The other thing is you know, silly, half-crazy, stupid ideas. They can be chucked into draft three, where you suddenly think, maybe there's a link between these two ideas I'm writing about. And the link could be this. And your thinking as you write it, it's probably not this. But it might be this, maybe. Maybe on the next draft, my brain will think of something else, and I'll be able to justify that. Or I can always get rid of it later. That's OK. You know, so there's room for exploration, taking risks at each stage of the process, because it can just get wiped out later if it doesn't work out. And this process then is, is iterated from draft two to three, three to four, four to five. Each stage, producing <coughs> your brain producing new things that are exploring the space of connections and possibilities, and then also getting, out, getting rid of the things that are obviously not working out, and you hope going towards something that, that works. And in my experience, the process is amazing. And it discovers things that you as a, as a single human brain can never discover without this kind of process. So one metaphor I wanted to mention here is that this idea that you know, this is a rocket, and the rocket can go great places, but it needs a launching pad to get off the ground. The launching pad is like an idea in your fourth draft that is sitting there, and it's not quite right. But it hits your brain, and it gives you the thought for an, another idea that is much better. That idea can get into your text, take off, and when you finish it, that idea might be the central part of the whole text, the thing that you think is the best part. And you'll never remember the launching pad that was there in draft four. But it was crucially important in, in ever getting you to the stage of being able to think the thought that was the right thought. So there's this evolutionary process of pieces building upon pieces. All the pieces eventually get taken away, like the scaffolding below a building that's put up. And you just see the final structure. But it's that history and that experimentation and exploration that, that makes it all work out. So it really is a process of discovery and creativity. I just thought I'd give you one example from something I just recently wrote. So this is an article for Bloomberg about how fake news spreads on Facebook. And it was looking at some research that shows that um, what, what the people who spread fake news have done is they use the data that Facebook gathers to target. Um, they try to seed a kind of epidemic of fake news by targeting those people who they think will have the least information available to know whether this is true or not. So they're the easiest people to try to get something going with. And they can use this information to target their advertising on those people and then they can get this thing going. So eventually on, on draft five of, of this thing when I was working on, I had this phrase, ad technology has weaponized disinformation, which is a, a efficient way of saying what I just said. But there's no way my brain would have come up with that phrase at the outset. 
it's way too efficient. My brain had to go through lots of other channels. And eventually in draft five, the, the, the mechanism of this evolutionary process had put together a sentence that said this, but in a much more convoluted, crazy, complicated way. And my brain looked at it and after a few minutes said, well, uh, oh, all that's saying is ad technology is weaponized disinformation. And then the writing becomes better. But again, it, it's almost like not my responsibility. I didn't do it. The mechanism just put it into my face, and then I had to deal with it, and that's what came out. So there is this intelligence in the, in the mechanism that m gives your writing a creativity that it doesn't otherwise have. So um, I'm just about finished. Um, so why is my book smarter than I am? Because it's been co-authored. It's my brain using this mechanism of evolution. So I should really put evolution in as a, as a co-author. It's this mechanism that is inherently creative and discovers things and explores things and is just uh, an amazing thing. Um, so, and one reason I, I think this is important is that, as I said, I'm teaching these graduate students how to write and they're all terrified of writing. They think it's impossible and they need to know that this mechanism is out there and it can work for anybody and not just professional writers. Um, professional writers learn about it and use it as their ally because it takes so much of the pain out. Um, and it's part of the mystery of why when you pick up a, a book, it seems like that, so, that person is so amazingly such a genius. It's because there's a lot of this going on behind the scenes that you don't know about. So I'll just, I'll finish there. There's a quote from Stephen King I like. It says, I write to find out what I think. I don't know what I think. I'm going to discover what I think as part of the writing process. So thank you. Yeah.